You've tuned in to I Am Not a Number Live, the review show with Cardinal Sin and Captain Cockney Spock, where we review a different episode of The Prisoner starring Patrick McGuhan. Each week, we discuss a different episode and its implications then and now. Follow along and make sure to catch the episode in our viewing order so you can be ready to ask questions and participate in the chat. New episodes premiere each week on Wednesdays from 3 to 5 Central. The show's surreal and political implications on the reduction of the individual to a number have an even more insidious impact today as all of our information, phone calls, texts, likes, photos, and other data are harvested to be sold and turn us into product rather than consumers. Get ready for a deep dive into one of the most important shows to have an impact on pop culture and society ever. And remember, I am not a number. Greetings, greetings, followers. It is I, Cardinal Sin. Welcome to episode number two of I Am Not a Number. And with me, I have my co-host, Captain Cockney Spock, and Tracy Torme. Greetings, gentlemen. Hello there. Hello. Good to see you both. Yeah, and man. I hope you enjoyed that little opening I put together. It's great. And really I'm going to go ahead and uh, read a little information about our star because he was an amazing man uh first of all captain a little Speaking. trivia pop quiz and uh we'll go to tracy if uh you don't know the answer <laughs> what nationality was patrick McGowan? oh now there's a there's a sticky wicket he's not swedish that's for sure now English would be the most obvious choice, but with a name like McGowan, would it be correct to say that he was actually Irish? Bingo. That's right. Right? So I'm going with Irish. Incorrect. Oh, he's down to get Polish. Polish. Oh, I no. Said Polish. American. Oh. Patrick what? Joseph McGowan was a British Irish American actor, screenwriter, producer, and director. Born wow. in the US to Irish parents, he was raised in Ireland and England. He began his career in England in the 1950s and moved back to the US in the 1970s. His career defining roles were in the British television series Danger Man, or in the US Secret Agent, and the surreal psychological drama The Prisoner, which he co-created. He received two Primetime Emmy Awards and a BAFTA. Early career. Captain, do you know who discovered Patrick McGowan? I'm afraid to say. I'm still reeling from the first answer. I'm still going with British <laughs> Irish. The, no, Bugs Bunny. Tracy? <laughs> Don't have any idea on that one. Orson Welles. Wow. And How's that? for completists or fans that would like to see his more obscure work, I'm going to tell you a little bit about his early career. In 1955, McGowan starred in a West End stage production of Serious Charge as a Church of England vicar accused of being homosexual. Orson mm -hmm. Welles was so impressed by McGowan's stage presence, intimidated, Welles would later say, that he cast him as Starbuck in his York Theatre production of Moby Dick, Rehearsed. Welles said in 1969 that he believed McGowan would be, I think, one of the big actors of our generation if TV hadn't grabbed him. He can still mm -hmm. make it. He was a tremendous player as Starbuck, and with all the required attributes, looks, intensity, unquestionable acting ability, and a twinkle in his eye. 
Hmm. So, Interesting. you guys, I want you to tell me when I hit on the first of the following in which you saw Patrick McGowan, okay? Mm-hmm. McGowan's first television appearance was as Charles Stewart Parnell in The Fall of Parnell for You Are There in 1954. He also had small roles in Passage Home, The Dark Avenger, and I Am Camera, all in 1955. He could also be seen in Zarek in 1956. On TV, he was in Margin for Error in Terminus in 1955. Guest starred on The Adventures of Sir Lancelot and Assignment Foreign Legion, The Vice, (laughs) and The Adventures of Aggie, and also played the lead in the Makepeace story for BBC Sunday Night Theater in 1955. He also appeared in Wells' film of Moby Dick Rehearsed, and he did Ring for Caddy on stage in 1956. While working as a stand-in during screen tests, McGoon was signed to a contract with the Rank Organization. They put him in mostly villainous parts, High Tide at Noon, Hell Drivers, along with Sean Connery and William Hartnell, and those were in 1957, and the steamy pot boiler, the Gypsy and the Gentleman, in 1958. Hell Drivers was the first thing that he did that I saw. Hmm. He had good roles on TV in anthology series such as Television Playwright, Folio, Armchair Theater, ITV Play of the Week, and ITV Television Playhouse. He was given a leading role in Nor the Moon by Night, 1958, shot in South Africa. After some clashes with the management, the contract was dissolved. He then did some TV work, including Tales of the Vikings, winning a BAFTA in 1960. His favorite part for the stage was the lead in Ibsen's Brand, for which he received an award. He also played the role in a still extant BBC television production in August of 1959. Michael Meyer, who translated the stage version, thought McGowan's performance was the best and most powerful he'd ever seen. It was McGowan's last stage appearance for 28 years. So now we move on to Danger Man. Production assistant Uh, Executive Lou Grade soon approached McGoon about a television series where he would play a spy named John Drake. Having learned from his experience at rank, McGoon insisted on several conditions. All the fistfights should be different, the character would always use his brain before using a gun, and, much to the executive's horror, no kissing. The show debuted in 1960 as Danger Man a half-hour program geared toward American audiences. It did fairly well, but not as well as hoped. Production lasted a year and 39 episodes. After the first series was over, an interview asked McGowan if he would have liked it to continue. He replied, Perhaps, but let me tell you this. I would rather do 20 TV series, then go through what I went through under that rank contract I signed a few years ago, and for which I blame no one but myself. (laughs) Post Danger Man. McGowan appeared in Two Living, One Dead, 1961, shot in Sweden. He appeared in two films directed by Basil Drearden, All Night Long, an updating of Othello, and Life for Ruth, both in 1962. He also starred in an adaptation of The Quare Fellow in 1962. McGowan was one of several actors considered for the role of James Bond in Dr. No. While McGowan, a Catholic, turned down the role on moral grounds, the success of the Bond films is generally cited as the reason for Danger Man being revived He was later considered for the same role in Live and Let Die, but turned it down again. McGowan spent some time working for Disney on The Three Lives of Thomasina in 1963 and The Scarecrow of Romney Marsh, The Return of Danger Man. 
after he had turned down the role of Simon Templar in The Saint, Lou Grade asked McGowan if he wanted to do John Drake and give it another try. This time, McGowan had even more to say about the series. Danger Man, in the U.S., Secret Agent, was resurrected in 1964 as a one-hour program. The scripts allowed McGowan more range in his acting. Because of the popularity of the series, he became the highest paid actor in the UK and the show lasted almost three more years. After shooting the only two episodes of Danger Man to be filmed in color, McGowan told Lou Grade he was going to quit for another show. In the face of McGowan's intention to quit Danger Man, Grade asked if he would at least work on something for him. McGowan gave him a rundown of what would later be called a miniseries about a secret agent who resigns suddenly and wakes up to find himself in a prison disguised as a holiday resort. Grade asked for a budget, McGowan had one ready, and they made a deal over a handshake on a Saturday morning to produce The Prisoner. In addition to being the series star, McGowan was an executive producer forming Everyman Films with producer David Tomlin and also wrote and directed several episodes, in some cases using pseudonyms. The originally commissioned seven episodes became 17. Uh, Let me see. I want to make sure I don't give away any spoilers here. Uh, The filming location was the Italian village of Port Marion in North Wales, which was featured in some episodes of Danger Man. The title character, the otherwise named Number Six, spends the series trying to escape from a mysterious prison community called The Village and to learn the identity of his nemesis, Number One. MGM. During the production of The Prisoner, MGM cast McGowan in an action film, Ice Station Zebra, in 1968, for which his performance as a tightly wound British spy grew, drew critical praise. After the end of The Prisoner, he presented a TV show, Journey into Darkness, from 68 to 69. He was meant to follow it up with the star Dirk Sturen in an expensive adaptation of the James Clavell bestseller Taipan, but the project was canceled before filming. Instead, he made The Moonshine War, 1970, mm-hmm. for, 19, for MGM. In the 70s, great, McGowan played James Stewart, first Earl of Moray in Mary, Queen of Scots, in 1971. He directed a Richie Haven's rock opera version of Othello, titled Catch My Soul, in 1974, but disliked the experience. McGowan received two Emmy Awards for his work on Columbo with his longtime friend Peter Falk. McGowan said his first appearance on Columbo, the episode was called By Dawn's Early Light in 1974, was probably his favorite American role. He directed five Columbo episodes, including three of the four in which he appeared, one of which he also wrote and two of which he also produced. McGowan was involved with the Columbo series in some capacity from 1974 to 2000. His daughter, Catherine McGowan, appeared with him in his final episode, Ashes to Ashes, in 1998. The other two Columbo episodes in which he appeared are Identity Crisis in 1975 and Agenda for Murder, 1990 didn't realize Columbo went for quite that long. As he had done in his career with the Rank Organization, McGowan began to specialize in villains, appearing in A Genius, Two Partners, and A Dupe, 1975, Silver Streak, 1976, and The Man in the Iron Mask in 1977. Also in 1977, He starred in the television series Rafferty as a retired army doctor who moves into private practice. He had the lead in a Canadian film, Kings and Desperate Men, 
then had support parts in Brass Target in 1978 and the Clint Eastwood film Escape from Alcatraz in 1979, portraying the prison's warden. He also had the lead in a TV movie, The Hard Way, in 1979. 1980s. In 1981, he appeared in the science fiction horror film Scanners, which was the first time I saw him, in the Jamaica Inn in 1983 and Trespasses in 84. In 1985, he appeared on Broadway for his only production there, starring opposite Rosemary Harris for Hugh Whitemore's Pack of Lies, in which he played another British spy. He was nominated for a Drama Desk Award as Best Actor for his performance. On screen, he could be seen in Baby, Secret of the Lost Legend, 85, of Pure Blood, 1986, and an episode of Murder, She Wrote. In the 1990s, McGowan starred in The Best of Friends, 1991, for Channel 4, which told the story of the unlikely friendship behind a museum creator, a nun, and a playwright. McGowan played George Bernard Shaw alongside Sir John Gielgud as Sidney Cockerell and Dame Wendy Hiller as Sister Laurentia McLaughlin. In the United States, the drama was shown by PBS as part of Masterpiece Theatre. Also in this period, he featured as King Edward I in Braveheart, 1995, which won five Academy Awards. It seemed to revitalize McGowan's career. He was then seen as Judge Omar Noose in A Time to Kill in 1996 and in The Phantom, also in 1996, a cinema adaptation of the comic strip. The 2000s. In 2000, I did not know this until I did my research. In 2000, he reprised his role as number six in an episode of The Simpsons, The Computer War <laughs> Menace Shoes. In it, Homer Simpson concocts a news story to make his website more popular, and he wakes up in a prison designed as a holiday resort. Dubbed number five, he meets number six and later betrays him and escapes with his boat referencing his numerous attempts to escape on a raft in The Prisoner, number six splutters, that's the third time that's happened. <laughs> McGowan's last film role was the voice of Billy Bones in the animated film Treasure Planet, released in 2002. That same year, he received the Prometheus Hall of Fame Award for The Prisoner. McGowan was in 30 films and 21 television shows, he won the 1960 BAFTA Award for Best Actor, the 1975 Primetime Emmy for Outstanding Single Performance by a Supporting Actor in a Comedy or Drama Series for Columbo by Don's Early Light, and the 1990 Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Guest Actor in a Drama Series for Columbo, Agenda for Murder. Following a brief illness, McGowan died in a Santa Monica Claire... California Hospital on January 13th, 2009. He was 80 years old. And that, really there we have homework, the life Bill. and times of Patrick McGowan. You really did your homework. I'm, my, I'm instantly curious about the show you said he did called Journey into Darkness. Because that mm -hmm. was, I think, right after The Prisoner. You know anything about that show? All I know is it was from 1968. To 1969. Wow, that's right. But about now we all time, have something so. to look forward to, right? Mm -hmm. And let's yeah. go ahead and say hello to some people in the chat. Tessa Dick is here. And mm. hello, the Tessa. Sliders fan blog is here. Yay. Hey there, everyone. Hail to Cam Cam. Cam Cam. Hail Cam Cam. Canadian Spider Man is here. Hail Canadian Spider-Man. Matthew Pounder. Hail Matthew. And he asks, was David Jones, Ice Station Zebra, John Drake? Don't know. No. Yes, but I he know. also mentions two different, two different characters. That but he thinks episodes of Journey into Darkness are on YouTube, Tracy. 
So can you maybe tell, you can tell us see anything it. about the series? Though, what was it? What was it? A uh, how was it horror? Let me take a quick that? look. Yeah. You guys will have to vamp for me while I look it up. Well, I mean, officially, Danger Man is not the prisoner, but that's what we were discussing yesterday. I mean, already we're into the topic of what is canon, because officially, Danger Man and the prisoner are two different people. But unofficially, as Mr. Tormay here knows from personal experience through asking Mr. McGowan, unofficially, they are the same person, correct? Yes, he did. It's definitely tell me that they are the same. So maybe he wasn't supposed to tell me that, but he told me that. Okay, so here's the information I bought, uh, pulled up on the Internet Movie Database. Hammer's 1968 American TV series, Journey into the Unknown, produced only 17 episodes. Hmm, where have we heard that before? Hmm. Yeah. Eight of which were subsequently compiled into four Erzatz feature films that made rounds in syndication over the following decade, but haven't been seen since the 70s. Journey into Darkness was hosted by Patrick McGowan. Journey to Midnight by Sebastian Cabot. Journey to the Unknown and Journey to Murder, both representing the last on-screen work of Joan Qua Ugh, Crawford. I can't talk today. Like the company's policy dating back to the early 1950s, an American actor was imported to provide easier access to U.S. distribution, continued by Hammer on both their 1980s shows, The Hammer House of Horror and Hammer House of Mystery and Suspense. Oh. A sardonic Patrick McGowan makes the most of his introduction, aiding the two stories that comprise Journey into Darkness. I'd so, love to see that. That'd there really we have it. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Apparently, it's available on YouTube. Well, you were right about the quality of these new releases of The Prisoner because the one that I just saw, I saw Arrival. Boy, it was so clear and sharp. It was great. Fucking really amazing, well. right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, absolutely. Incredible. Um, and... Like I've mentioned before, uh, the amazing remaster is in 1080p and 5.1 surround, and uh, it looks like it was made yesterday. It really does. Very true. It really does. It really does. Uh, Captain, you did your rewatch uh, yesterday, correct? That is correct, sir. Physical media, DVD, but of course for the full 1080p experience, that would require a Blu-ray. But yes, DVD is the medium of choice at the moment. And uh, your opinion of the remaster? Uh, very good. Uh, what you, do you mean the actual physical quality or the story seeing it again? Because in both, No, the, the physical quality, you know, the remaster itself. Excellent. No, very good quality, bright colors. I could see everything. And uh, I could observe and go, well, look, it's a French maid. Amazing. <laughs> I did three times to myself, of course. There is a lady in a <laughs> French maid outfit. <laughs> it is. Which yeah. is one of Captain Cockney show. Spock's uh, favorite things. Indeed. Maybe that's where I got it from. I, mean, I woke up and I looked at <laughs> my, my big white circular chair and I thought, maybe the prisoner's got uh, been an even bigger an influence than I first gave it credit for. I am effectively in the village. I mean, there's no one else here at the moment, but uh, I'm broadcasting mm. to you from the village. Hello. Are, are we not mm -hmm. all in the village? Really? Yeah. Yeah, some of us more than we others. all live in a yellow submarine. Don't forget that. That's Indeed. right. And Ringo, you can come the down off the ceiling. Yoko's gone. We can party again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice. Well, it was really so, interesting for me because... Sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Tracy. I was just going to say, um, it took me right back to a time in my life when I saw it because I hadn't seen it. I don't think since then, when I first saw it, um, m my dad used to travel in the summer a lot from city to city doing different gigs here and there. So it was kind of a tradition in my family that I would get to go with him in the summer. And it was kind of like a, a, a vacation of sorts. And I just happened to remember that, I was in Miami Beach for like two weeks when The Prisoner first aired. And we saw it 
there. And uh, it just took me back immediately to that time. You know how... Uh, Can you guys still see me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You froze up. Uh, um, it was you fascinating said to see it again. Yeah. That you, uh, uh, it took you back to a time and that's more or less when we lost you. I, I said, it took me back to a time in my life, kind of like uh, a song does, you know, you've heard that, that you hear a song and think, Oh yeah, this reminds me of this. Well, kind of did that to me because I remember yep. When I first saw it and how we all thought it was such a unusual show and so exciting. And uh, we were hooked from that first show on, definitely. Now, something I didn't realize is the title runs three minutes of every episode, which is a long time for a 50-minute show. Mm -hmm. And the car is initially coming down an airstrip at the beginning of the intro. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of fun. I wish I had it. I wish I'd had that car. Love yeah, that doesn't car. everybody? I was oh actually on a driveway. And not to, what kind of commute is he doing? He's a bit lost, isn't he? Well, it's just for the intro, I think. But of course, not yeah. too, I've got uh, an interesting uh, question for London. you guys. Uh huh. Go ahead. What does everyone think? What does everyone think? The car? What model was the car? I have a theory. Actually, it's it's mentioned not. later, but not in this, this episode. I was thinking it was a Lotus. Exactly what I was thinking. Oh, but yeah, who knows? Not a Lotus. Well, definitely not a Lotus Esprit, put it that way. I don't know. Jolly, hmm. jolly zippy, though, isn't it? Nice and low. Oh, my God. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, Canadian Spider-Man yeah. says, I had no idea who Patrick was until Cardinal Sin mentioned him. Glad I now know. Hmm. Hmm. Well, well, since well, you're kind of focusing on Magoon, uh, instead of, you know, as opposed to just the show, I mean, Magoo and himself, I was thinking when I was watching Arrival, uh, he has the most amazing intensity. Did I just cut out? Can you still hear no, me? No, that's perfect. Amazing intensity. Okay. He had the most amazing intensity where the guy could just give a look and, you know, he would make you shrink. I mean, it's just incredible. And I noticed how in Arrival, he is so much acting like a cornered animal he kind of looks like you know an animal at the zoo that's trying to pace around his cage and get the most of it and always look for a way out and that yeah. seemed to me that's what he was doing through the whole episode he was pacing intensely and looking for a way out at all times and of course it makes total sense given the themes of the show but pretty brilliant way of acting i, I thought Personally, mm. and Cam Cam says, "Interesting how prescient some of these shows are about where we are today." Yes, and that's some perfect. of what we're going to discuss. So, absolutely, the Northwest Port, uh, the Northwest Wales Port of Marion, is still a tourist spot, and people would come down and spend a fortune for the weekend. The suit at the beginning of this episode doesn't match the blazer he would wear in later later episodes but it is called arrival so um and it's the it's the I think only it'd be fun to go to Port Marion. arrival is See, the sorry? only episode where everyone absolutely everyone agrees it's the first episode after this we're in, going to be in murky waters so this is actually, where everyone says you know it's <laughs> strange um i was looking at uh Robert Meyer Burnett and Az's viewing order, and they watched Free For All first. So what? I say they didn't even hmm. agree on the first one. I say so fuck their viewing is. order I entirely. Wow! They didn't for agree on arrival, Mind blown. for people that are curious, um, we are going to announce our viewing order now, and go. if you will. Give me a moment here. This is called the uh, Captain Cockney Spock. It's the on the inside of my DVD viewing order. So after a lot of careful consultation, cross-referencing of plot points, and uh, uh, studying of the overall 
emotional arc, we've decided to go with the order on my DVD player. Because it's just easier, yes. though. I don't have to keep ejecting the disc that way. Thanks very much. Cool, physical Which media. Which is the following. So, Arrival. Next week will be the chimes of Big Ben. Then A, B, and C. Then Free For All. Then number five, The Schizoid Man. Number six, The General. Then Many Happy Returns. Then Dance of the Dead. Then Checkmate. Then Hammer Into Anvil. Mm -hmm. Then It's Your Funeral. Number 12, A Change of Mind. Then Do Not Forsake Me, Oh My Darling. Next will be Living in Harmony. And then The Girl Who Was Death. And then Once Upon a Time. And then, of course, the last episode, Fall Out. So there you have it. That's going to be our viewing That's order. Good. And I'm going to put that in the description box following our live stream so that everybody knows exactly what the viewing order will be for the future. Nice. Very good. I'm looking forward to Checkmate, a little bit of uh, chess trivia. That's actually the first time someone's ever said Checkmate to me. It's a little chess joke there. Moving on. Hmm. That's funny. <laughs> Thanks. And so that's the order we're going with. I'm still shocked, though. So that, so there are people out there that don't start with a rival. Now, that's, that's borderline silly. You're all free. You know, you're free to put pineapple on your pizza, but starting the prisoner with any episode apart from a rival, that is crazy silly. talk. Yeah, it is. Um, Matthew Pounder mentions that George Markenstein is the bald man that Patrick McGowan hands his resignation letter into in the intro. And he was the executive oh. story editor on The Prisoner. So he's handing his resignation in to the guy that has to pass or fail the scripts. Actually, and co-writer. Kind of he's resigned to his resignation. The, uh, the the writer credit at the start of the episode, George uh, Markstein, is the uh, first name that comes up. Exactly right. Yep, spot on. Boom, synchronicity. Um. David Tomlin was the producer, writer, and Patrick's best friend. And Bernie Williams was Tomlin's AD, the second AD. And uh, when Tomlin was the AD, he was the second AD. And uh, he was a very experienced second AD. Uh, Bernie Williams was the production manager on the series on the first 13 episodes. Tony Sloan is the series librarian sort of the archivist from whom some of this information comes that i have and patrick mcgoon wasn't only the star of the series but was also the writer the director and producer now tracy in our previous episode the one that we sort of did as the series overall uh tracy, summary summing up summary yeah. summary uh, the penny farthing that you see around the series is meant to represent the old times and that we are heading into the modern world, which Patrick thought was dangerous and not as safe as it was before. Hmm. Boy, he didn't even know what was coming in the future. He'd think it's 10 times more no dangerous idea. now. Yeah. Uh, the interesting and, thing about the penny, penny farthing to, to me is that it looks very old and very futuristic at the same time. I can't think Doesn't of really it? anything else. Right. That I think. Yeah. Um, another thing is when he uses the taxi, the taxi driver asks him for two credits, please. And the credit units, uh, credit units were looking forward to a time when people wouldn't use money and it was shot at a time when people didn't use credit cards at all. Right. I mean, you can really get quite deep into that because uh, for me, it stuck out. I don't know if it was meant to stick out, but so when she goes, oh, you can pay me later. And I was just like, 
I've been around capitalism for 50 years. No one's ever said, pay me later. That's uh, that just uh, for me was a nice little subtle touch that he is indeed in completely a different world. Pay me later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Another set of words I've <laughs> never heard in my entire life. Pay me later. That's a good point. You pay me now. Like, <laughs> like you were saying earlier, Captain. Show me the uh, money. Exactly. Yeah, the the idea that the prisoner is John Drake is one that people have kicked around for years. And uh, Tracy, I think on our last show, on our last episode, you said that you asked him about that and he sort of smiled and was vague. Is that right? Sorry, Gil, I missed all of that. You said uh, people in are our, kicking around in our with previous it. episode. Uh, right. You mentioned to him that, you know, people argue back and forth about whether John Drake is the prisoner and that he sort of smiled and gave you a vague answer. Is that right? Well, yes, sort of a vague answer, but ultimately, I definitely... I think he's cutting out there, or is it just me? No, he cut out. I'm waiting for him to come back. Just at the key, because I never know when to jump. The moment I jump in, it's going to keep jumping in again. It's uh, This thing's got a sense of comedy timing. It's always just as Tracy's getting Tracy, to the essential bit. You, you froze <laughs> when you started to go into your explanation. Just as we're on the edge okay, of our real seats, quick. Tracy. <laughs> oh, my God. Really quick, uh, and, I said. By the way, John Tracy, Drake, I didn't if you could lean forward yeah. when you're talking, we'll yeah. be able to see you much sure. better. Thank you. There we go. I'm, I've got a Patrick Magoo and look on my face there. Um, there you go. Yeah, I asked him if John Drake was re really the prisoner, and he sort of smiled and said something, the best of my recollection, said something along the lines of, Well, what do you think? And I said, Well, I think it is. And then he nodded and kind of smiled, and he said something cryptic. Like, well, if you bet on that, it would be a pretty safe bet or something like that. Um, yeah. But he was basically reaffirming that it is John Drake. And, and I think when my he, point of view yeah. is that if he's not John Drake, he's as close as to John Drake as makes no difference. So it might as well be. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that if you think of the way the whole series was created coming out of Danger Man and the fact that Lou Grade wanted to continue with danger man the way patrick explained it to me was just kind of a compromise in a way all right i'll continue with the character but only if it's in this new idea that's pretty much the way he explained it to me and the sliders fan blog asks is there a blu-ray for america slash ntsc i can't find one well sliders flan the sliders fan blog right there. sorry there's a slight delay in my headphones that's why i'm kind of slurring my speech sliders i'm not drunk i swear blog. don't say sliders um, flan slide sliders fan blog sliders thank you captain appreciate that um there was a release of a blu-ray for the 40th anniversary by shout factory and by the time i found out about it it was sold out so i went to the library they didn't have it I had to go through interlibrary loan, and uh, I, I backed them up before I sent mm. them back. So now I have these pristine copies to view. Um, I submit that we need to start a fan, say, petition to Shout Factory to make another run because clearly yes. there just aren't enough of these beautiful blu-rays of uh that box set and let them charge an arm and leg for it actually it was it was really inexpensive it was less than twenty dollars well they um, they didn't i can tell you they didn't spend five cents on production things for the sliders box set or things like that they did nothing no. i mean they literally put no effort into it at all so but for the prisoner oh boy did they yeah, I, spend uh, enough money that they really should keep it in constant 
you know, for sale. Well, I'll tell you guys a quick story. My wife bought me the entire uh, prisoner set, I guess the Blu-ray set. And the only problem is we just moved, as you know, and we've mo- a lot of our stuff is in storage still. And mm-hmm. we have nothing really to play it on. So I haven't even looked at it yet. But then you were, were nice enough to tell me about the Amazon Prime for the right. for a prisoner. And you're right. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, really well mastered. We really enjoyed it. So we're just going to watch the whole series there. Oh, I'm so there. glad. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. And And thanks to Robin for helping set up everything on your end. I really appreciate her help. My little surfer girl, I will tell her. Thank you. Yeah. No. So, according to one of the producers, Patrick could see that we were heading into a world of numbers. He'd walk into a Chinese restaurant, and all the meals had numbers. So, he'd say, <laughs> I want the chicken noodles. And they'd say, what number is it? And he'd say, <laughs> so, I want two portions of number 35 and half a portion <laughs> of 16. <laughs> and... Uh, this producer went on to say telephone numbers, national health service numbers, car license numbers, house numbers, bank oh. account numbers, credit card numbers. You start to think about how many numbers control your life. It gets really scary. And I'm sure that's what Patrick was making a statement about, that your identity, your individualism was just a bunch of numbers. You weren't a person anymore. We weren't people. We were just reduced to a collection of numbers. That's, I think, very, very right on the nose for what he was saying with this series. Um, You know, guys, now that we're doing this show, I'm so regretful that I didn't tape record my entire time with him. Because Wouldn't that have been something? Oh, it was. It went on for like an hour and a half, maybe almost two hours. And I asked him everything. And at the end of it, I thought, boy, I'm such an idiot because... There's probably a hundred more questions that that prisoner fans want to ask if they had this opportunity. But part of the reason was I wasn't expecting it to necessarily go that way. I was thinking I would have 10 minutes with him and I was just trying not to get him angry at me sure. by looking like no a idea. fool, you know? Yeah. And, and after a while, he relaxed so much and that relaxed me. And the last, you know, two thirds of my time with him, he was extremely laid back and friendly. But you know what? He never really lost his unique intensity. He was always intense, even when he was being friendly and even when he was relaxed. He had this intensity to his personality that was exactly like you see in TV. Um, And again, Tracy, if you could lean forward when you talk, we can see you a lot better. Okay, sure, sure, um, sure. And Orson Welles called it uh, intimidating. Mm. Uh, and Matthew Pounder goes on to say, the black and white photo that goes into the filing cabinet in the intro is a publicity portrait from Danger Man. Uh, hmm. Also, that when you were it, going that over... That makes Sorry, it a little ahead. bit meta, because uh, in a way, it's, uh, the prisoner isn't just uh, John Drake, but it's also Patrick McGowan, because he himself wanted to uh, retire, indeed, from playing Danger Man, at least in his uh, previous format. So it, it is, in a way, a bit meta. It's uh, it's uh, Patrick retiring as well as John Drake. Hmm. To a degree, although he acted for decades after that. But just yeah, sorry, not, not, retiring not as Danger Man. Yeah, um, but retiring of that character. So that's but it did make him the highest paid actor in the UK, and that's that's got to be something. Two shillings and sh- sixpence. And all the when keys. you were going over his uh, his past, I wanted to recommend uh, The Moonshine War. It's a really offbeat mm-hmm. movie. I think Alan Alda is in it, believe it or not, and Patrick, and I think they were like... Uh, trying to bust moonshiners down in the South. And it's actually, as I remember, it's a pretty good movie. And I totally remember him being in it. Um, But nobody knows that movie at all anymore. But kind of recommend that one. Now, another piece of trivia about the show in general, but also about Arrival, is the set for Number Two's office was on the same stage as the control room. 
They're both round, and they both have projection screen TVs in the rear. And they had to shoot and check all the scenes shot on set before they could rebuild the sets and shoot the other scenes. And in the studio next door, Stanley Kubrick was filming 2001. So it was a very technologically advanced situation for both the series and the film. And in addition, Rover began after Patrick remarked about his lava lamp, and they used to call lava lamps baby rovers. Mm. However, another interesting aside is that for the first three weeks of production, they didn't know how they were going to make Rover. So in this Mm. first uh, episode, Arrival, they just sort of reacted to it, you know, like it was going to be something very scary. He told me a lot about the, uh, the the way they did Rover. I'm sure most of the fans of the show know this already, but it was, I guess it was like a unusual weather balloon that had come out mm-hmm. that uh, he saw it in the sky or something on a tethered. And then they wanted to know if it would bounce and it did. And it became the perfect Rover, you know? So uh, a brilliant part of the show because that feeling when Rover attacks someone and they are yes. smothered is really uh, memorable. Everybody who's a little bit claustrophobic would appreciate yes. that. Um, I also remember, guys, when I watched Arrival, one of the things he did tell me about was he really couldn't stand little, I don't know if the right word is platitudes, but when people said things that were throwaway lines like, how have you been? What's going on? What's up? Things like that. Um, he found that kind of insidious in a way. He just didn't like it. So you notice mm-hmm. that there's a lot of times in the prisoner be seeing you and it's a beautiful day and, th- you know, things like that. He was making his statement about the ways that we uh, waste precious time with uh, stupid things. Trivialities. That's kind of what he was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. In in this episode, people walk past him and say, beautiful day and Mm -hmm. things like that. And yeah, Mm -hmm. it's uh, what we would call small talk. Yeah. And uh, like me in the morning. Top of the morning, Captain Cockney Spot. Good day, isn't it? Fuck off coffee. (laughs) Yeah. Get me some coffee. Also, I think in Arrival, when the entire uh, sequence with Cobb, the guy that he recognizes and who ends up mm-hmm. supposedly jumping out a window and then you find out he's alive. Wait, wait for it. Wait for it. We don't want to spoil the ending. It's a nice little tease, though. It's a little teaser. It is. Now, okay, the man yeah. that you see running and killed by Rover at the beginning was Seamus Byrne, an assistant director, and it was a way of saying how deadly Rover could be. Because Rover can bring people back, or they can just be lunch. Yeah. And there was actually an alternative version of uh, Arrival where Rover had a heartbeat and you hear him talk, but mm. that was sort of organic rather than the kind of technological aspect that they were wanting to use. Well, I'm, I'm resisting game. talking about Rover till we get to that scene, but it really is not clearly explained what Rover is. So I think both tonally. And uh, uh, technologically, it's a real kind of shift in gear for the show. But I hold my counsel until we get to that point in the show. (laughs) Absolutely. And they shot about half on location and about half in studios. Great production value. Looks better 54 years later than when they shot it. Well, what a godsend. What a godsend it was to find Port Marion. Because oh, yeah. to try to kind of create something from scratch, no matter how well they did, there would be a certain artificial quality to it. Instead, yes. you know, my wife had never seen The Prisoner. We watched it together today, and she kept saying, where is this place? What, what is this place? Is this a real place? Is this a set? And, you know, I, 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 from everything I've heard, I mean, somebody had heard of or witnessed the place before, Ooh. maybe Patrick. Do you know no? what? Hmm. Sorry. 
That's oh, you, go ahead. you guys are making me realize that uh, the, the surreal nature of the village is actually even more surreal than it would have been when the show was made. Because, of course, at the time, the show was contemporary. But now, of course, being it's like if they remade The Prisoner now, would they make it contemporary again? Would they set it in 2021 or 22? Or would they indeed set it in the previous uh, established time period in the early or mid 60s? And therefore, uh, it would be uh, a historical. But of course, because it was filmed uh, at the time contemporary, but is now set in the past. We would call that a period piece. And as Cardinal knows, I'm very tedious about being uh, knowing the difference between contemporary, historical and period. But this is a classic example of a period piece. But it makes me realise that uh, with Rover, it's obviously a little bit surreal. But uh, even without mm. Rover, given that it's set in a, a different time from us, and uh, even more, it's even weirder for you guys not being Brits because a uh, certain elements of the village, like Good Morning, uh, well, that's just that's just Britain how it was, isn't it? But uh, right. if you've uh, if you've not been to the sixties, as it were, and not been to Britain, then it just gives it an extra level of surrealism that wasn't even there for Patrick in a way. I've just realised that. So mm. hey, this show's been and, great for me. Uh, in addition, yeah, good point. The uh, Northwest Wales Port Marion is still a tourist spot and people would mm. come down and spend a fortune for the weekend and uh one of the things that was mentioned is that the of course the uh helicopter shots uh they just shot on the ground with the camera mm. at the bottom looking up but yeah. when they actually had the helicopter go up in the air uh they would you know they were able to tell that they hadn't cleaned the chimneys because all these people that had spent a fortune to be at this resort in port marion got soot all over them and came running out of the building uh, uh, wow just covered in soot because it created a downdraft so mm. yes it's a real place it's a real resort and it's still there and furthermore, the old folks' home in this episode was a signifier that you're going to be there until you die. So it means mm. he's going to be there until he dies, and most people don't pick up on that. Yeah, I think you're right. That's, that's cool. Um, I remember watching the series when it first came on, and I, was, I wasn't even a teenager yet. And I remember rooting so hard for him to get off that island. I mean, I was really, you know, I remember being emotionally involved with rooting for him. And when he would get on something like the helicopter, you know, I'd be thinking, oh, you know, keep going, keep flying, you know. Um, so it, it really, I guess, depends on whether you buy into the premise of the show. But I, I really did. Um, I still think the uh, theme of the individual versus the mob is still incredibly uh, incredibly important an incredibly important theme to this day maybe more so than even then and actually uh, a member of government said that they take care of their agents when they retire they give them pocket money a house and a car so they don't defect which was one of mm -hmm. the foundations of how the series was made so the, the yeah, key you know, difference you you can see remnants of the Cold War in the script yeah. because he keeps alluding to which side he's on. And and uh, I, I saw sort of the undercurrent of the East Bloc or the communist world being wanted to drag the old uh, Western secret agents out to the other side. And uh, fascinating, really, when you think about it. Especially Actually, the, the way now the that you bring that up, Mm -hmm. There's a, a little chestnut for folks that haven't seen Danger Man but want to. Uh, there's an episode called Colony 3. And I personally think that that episode is what started getting Patrick McGowan thinking about The Prisoner. It, it seems to me to be the prototype for The Prisoner. Have you seen it? Believe it or not, I don't think I've ever seen an episode of Danger Man. Really? I don't even know. Are they wow. available still? 
Uh, yeah, I have the, uh, it's called the uh, Secret Agent Mega Set. Wow. So I got to try to find that. I'll, uh, I'll uh, figure out a way to uh, get it to you if it's no longer available. I'm, I'm, Fantastic. I'm, <clears throat> That'd be great. I'm still Thank reeling you. from from the revelations of what you've just said, guys. I don't know how you if you realise how profound you actually are, because you were just pointing out that uh, both in the fictional and the real world, a house and a car and nice retirement would be a, an enticement for a spy not to switch and become a double agent for the other side. But there's a key difference mm. here, and the clues in the title, the prisoner, it's not called the cushy retirement, is it? No. The no. key thing is, even though it's a velvet prison, and that's what makes it interesting, he is indeed the prisoner. Otherwise, the show would be called the relaxing retirement and would lose its <laughs> sense of danger. So that's the key. Mm. And you've made me realize something else. My, this show's great. You guys should be on YouTube. Oh, we are good. Okay, good. We're in the right <laughs> <laughs> Everything is as it should be, because I've also just realized it's a lovely little uh, moral. Hello, not Brian Young. Greetings. Catch 22, because uh, the character of the prisoner uh, decided to retire from his job, whether he was sick of the job inherently or the company that he worked for no pun intended and uh, the thing is if he if only he'd known that retirement would have caught they're the kind of people that would gas him kidnap him and imprison him then he would have retired a lot sooner so it's a bit of a catch-22 did he want to leave because he knew they're the kind of people that would kidnap him or did they kidnap him as is presented because he wanted to leave yeah yeah good I'm point curious to see what you guys think also <clears throat> the whole issue of why he resigned. Right. Do you think there's any hints or giveaways on that? Or what well, do you I've, think? I've just decided, yeah, he resigned because he's afraid that someone was going to gas him, kidnap him, and leave him in a village. That's why. The irony. That's why well, he resigned. Well, it's, it's on moral grounds. We know that. That, you know, he, he resigns for moral reasons. And in this episode... Uh, every time he asks a question, somebody that he's asking asks him another question or starts a different line of conversation, and then they just roll with it. So he never gets his questions answered. And every time mm -hmm. they ask him a question, he says something like, you know, who do you work for? Or Right. Whose side are you on? And and in this episode, he's asked whose side are you on? He says, I'm on our side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and kind of the point is Patrick McGowan isn't the prisoner. You know, he's not going to trust anybody having been a secret agent. He's ahead of everybody already. And something that a lot of people don't realize is that, you know, Patrick would be on the set all day. Then he'd be in his office writing until 10.30 at night. Then he'd be in the editing room looking at the dailies from the day before to see if it worked. And he worked 16 to 17 hours a day. He put his heart and soul mm -hmm. into the series, so it deserves all the success that it gets. I think he I also talked realized. about being, being burnt out toward the end, that he was really you know, physically exhausted and emotionally exhausted in the last few episodes. And he felt, I think he felt that the quality had slipped a little bit right before they went into the last two episodes, the two parter, which he knew was really important to the legacy of the series. But I think he felt that even before then they were starting to fade a bit. He was overworked. Yeah. And captain, you were going to say, yeah, I was just having a thought that, uh, well, typical me, I'm seeing a parallel now with Blade Runner. Because the whole thing with the prisoner is he Uh-oh, he here quits. we go. He, I, I couldn't mm. help myself. He, he quit, or indeed, you could say retired, before yeah, he realized retirement. they were make a prisoner. So after, after they made a, a prisoner of him, then the, he was uh, twice as keen to quit, basically. So indeed, uh, I was quit when I arrived at the village. I'm twice as quit now. Exactly. Mm. Um, right, that's and, a good point. When the controller goes to orange alert, it kind of reminds me of the scene in Red Dwarf where Rumor says, go to blue alert. And then some kind of missile attacks the ship and he says, go to red alert. 
And hey, Crichton you know, says, hey, Sir, are you absolutely sure it does mean <laughs> changing the bulb? Yeah. <laughs> Fucking <laughs> hysterical. Got to change the bulb, sir. Sir, it's a whole other bulb. <laughs> but the orange alert was used 40 years later in the United States for faux terrorism threats. And that shows how it predicted fucking everything. Right. Mm. I mean, take the cordless phones, for example. They obviously aren't real cordless phones because of the way they hold them. The hang-up is on the bottom, so if there were any keys, even though touch-tone phones were introduced in Pennsylvania in 1963, they weren't right. widely rolled out until the 1980s. Right. I remember having mm. our phones changed over from rotary dial phones in the early 80s. Uh, Captain, the rotary phones. Good when do you remember sure. getting touch-tone technology? It was ahead of its time. Do you remember getting touch-tone phones? Yeah, I got the amazing. I was like, Ma, look at all the numbers. You could just press the buttons, Ma. <laughs> you straight through. Conductor, <laughs> conductor, <laughs> low emergency services. Oh, forget it. I can't remember <laughs> what it was now. Oh, it was a fight. It was a fight. It was a, hello? Hello. Yeah, brilliant. Touchstone. Do you remember how old you were or what, what year was? 25. It was uh, 1995. No, sooner than that. Early 80s, I'd say. 82? Tracy, um, do you remember rotary boy. phones going to Touchstone? I still remember rotary phones, but as to what year they made the switch, boy, that's a that's a tough one. I don't know. Were I, you, if I thought for a while, I'd figure it out. Hmm. Yeah. Actually, I must have family in Pennsylvania. We're part of Pennsylvania Dutch. So I'm going to go 63. Yeah, it, is, was it wasn't forward. 63, but it didn't get rolled out. And I wasn't sure what the year was in the UK when it got rolled out. But the way they hold the phones, you can tell there are no actual, you know. Actually, they have three phones with different colors. So maybe they don't n need any you know, actual buttons. But uh, Cobb is played by Paul Eddington, who would go on to be a big star and was in three series, including Yes, Minister. And he does have that mm. cute little dimple in his chin. <laughs> now, it's important to remember that this was in the Cold War, and there was still the threat of Russia and H-bombs. There were hippie parades and anti-war demonstrations. It's peace. so different there was, from now. Yeah. Kind of a whole revolution of peace turning into <laughs> fear. And there were a lot of spy films being made and all kinds of shows and movies during this period. Uh, even James Coburn took a turn in Our Man Flint and In Like Flint. And there was James Bond, obviously, and The Saint yeah. with Roger Moore, another yeah. actor that was asked twice to play James Bond, but he had to turn it down for contractual obligation reasons because he was on a very successful series. But there was also Gil, I Spy we, and The Man from Uncle. We talked the other, we talked the other day about one of my all-time favorites, The President's Analyst. It gets into a lot of spy stuff in that movie, too. Right. And that came up on one of your shows it was unexpectedly. This Love is that film. so very, this is a very topical period of, you know, who is on whose side. And it's about fear and keeping secret secret. Even in World War II, there were signs all over London saying, be careful who you're talking to because yep. you may be giving, giving secrets away to the enemy. Loose and so here, you've got both things together because this was shot during the Summer of Love and the style and the look of it was heavily incorporated into the show. There are lava lamps everywhere because they were new at the time. Yes, mm. very nice. No, that was the one piece of set dressing. I mean, the camera did focus on one at one point, but the lava lamps mm. really stuck out. That's almost the counterpoint to the penny farthing, isn't it? One's the past and one's kind of the groovy future. And the danger of the future. Hmm. Indeed. Do you guys have any uh, preview hints about the second episode? What What did um, you guys decide is the second episode? It, it uh, has been decided. We're going to go with free for all for the second episode. Free for all. I'm going to go with Tracy. The I'm confused mm -hmm. already. We have decided we're only going to talk about the episode that we've seen. And episodes yeah. that we've seen. 
Yeah. So today, just about arrival. (laughs) Then next week, next Wednesday, we'll talk about this episode and the next episode. And Captain, did you say something about the the second episode? Yeah, no, um, there there is no second episode in my mind. Focused, laser-like, as I am on arrival. Was I wrong about Mm. free-for-all? Um, I, I thought, I'm just going from memory, I thought the second one was uh, the chimes of Big Ben, but then I thought, he's probably testing me. This is a test to see mm. whether we are in a, a consistent reality, but these days, who knows, so we'll let it go. The chimes uh, of it, Big Ben, you're right. I apologize. Yes, the brain is working. Well done, that's a biscuit. The chimes of Big Ben. Um, do you think most from, people have... That's from most people have the Captain's that? DVD set. That's the way A and E decided the release order would be, and it is different from the original order. So, Tracy, when you're watching these on Amazon Prime, make mm-hmm. sure to pay attention to the viewing order, and I'll try and send you uh, a copy so that you're aware uh, which which episode we're going to be on. Yeah, we we took okay, you to your word, Tracy. You said it didn't matter, so we thought, right, well, if it doesn't matter to him, no, he didn't say that. He did no, that was literally no. This is welcome to paying attention to your fellow guests because I remember mm. noting that when when Mister Tormay said it doesn't matter, I I just suggested that 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 in itself is a legit answer because of course when <laughs> people like me give a viewing order, that is of course with a built-in assumption of uh, it matters. So in a way, that's like the agnostic position. So no, uh, I, I'm Captain, not kidding. are you referring to something he said today? Or in no, the last, last episode. La- last no. week. They're, they're proving that last I episode, what he said was, Arrival has to be the first episode. Yes. Well, that's and the we last agreed. two episodes yes. have yes. to be the last two episodes. And the yes. 14 in between yes. Yes. can be in any order. I apologize. That's I right. used English that's incorrectly. Right. It's not my first language. The old uh, short-term the memory there. What? What I meant to say was, uh, Mr. Tormay said the order doesn't matter, with the exception of the first episode arrival and indeed the last two, with the exception. So I do apologize. I meant to say uh, he's not fussed about next week. But yes, we're all agreed today <laughs> is arrival. Fair yes. enough. Do you think most um, people ended up seeing Patrick in uh, Ice Station? He was going to ask if most people saw him in Ice Station Zebra first. Um, I did not. And to spoil a little bit, there was an episode which we're going to watch, you know, in the course of the next 16 weeks, where number six is not in the show because his consciousness has been moved to somebody else's body. And that was the week or however long it took for him to go and film his part in Ice Station Zebra. Right. So it was basically it was an uh, extra canonical way of getting him out of the show for, because of a scheduling conflict. on. Well, for him to get himself out, yeah. Because the prisoner can't leave, even to go shoot Ice Station Zebra. Right, because, uh, you know... He, I gave you one job, prisoner. Stay where we told you to. Yeah. And he was, of course, the person that, uh, uh, you know, put all that together. So here's a question. Yes. And uh, we'll You're add back, Tracy Steve back. Steve only the host. Back. On the show. Yep. Hey guys. We've got you back, back Tracy. The- Boy. Back from the other so dimension. Your, your question was... Do you think that people saw him in Ice Station Zebra first? Is that right? Right, right. Not. What a place to freeze. Great timing. If you answered that, I didn't hear it. Tracy, you froze yeah. up. So uh, I'm just basically I asked asking you, you the question more? and you yes. froze up. Just as you were about to give your answer. Can you repeat? My, my answer was simply, I was asking if you think most of the audience saw him in Ice Station Zebra. I really don't know. Can you still hear me? We can now. Kill? 
It, it, it was at the same time. Okay, so do you think most people repeat? did see him in Ice Station Zebra? Uh, before the prisoner? Just in general. I mean, I don't know how widespread that film got to be. It was a very big book, and it was an expensive movie, and it was a pretty big break for him to be in such a big American movie. But I wonder if he was really remembered or well um, seen in, in the part in that movie. The reason I'm asking is his character of Jones in that movie is rageful through the whole movie. He's just got a huge chip on his shoulder and he's full of intensity. And it's sort of the classic Patrick McGowan intensity that he had in The Prisoner is all throughout Ice Station Zebra. I wonder if people really saw it. Have you guys ever seen it? Oh, well, yes, no. of course. Hmm. However, yeah, of course. <laughs> I personally was turned on to the prisoner by a friend of mine, and then we saw Ice, Ice Station Zebra uh, mm -hmm. later. Um, mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to, you know, like, most people... Uh, like I said in my sort of long, boring, dry introduction about uh, Patrick and I his career. Cardinal, yeah, I'm not going to let you say that, but you said, I thought it was dynamic, exciting, and it set the parameters for the discussions that we're having now. Oh, good. Well Thank done. you. I, I appreciate that. It was really just something to read while we were waiting for people to roll in, but... Um, Well-researched. Thank you. Uh mm -hmm. In the UK, he was, on one hand, the highest paid actor from Danger Man, so he was very well known. He turned down Bond twice. He turned down, uh, uh, what was the other one? Um, the Saints? No, the Saints. Oh, Saint uh, the Saint. No, yeah, the Saint. He turned down the Saint yeah. also, I think, mm -hmm. twice. Yeah, um, right. You only did And so four. people in the UK certainly by that time knew who he was uh, mm -hmm. and he was very popular. Whether they saw The Prisoner first or I Station Zebra first, I think they probably saw The Prisoner first there because I Station Zebra didn't what? come out until 1968, the year after uh, The Prisoner did. So mm. uh, as far as the United States, boy, you got me. I have no idea. We'd have to ask people in the chat. Mm -hmm. Been an interesting uh, question. Intensified says, such a fantastic show this was. We don't get quality like this anymore, guys. No, oh, that's nice. Well said. Thank you. Oh, and thanks for subscribing. Robert P. Fitton. Glad to have you. So, um... By the way, are we going to actually sort of go through different elements of the episode in chronological order? Because I made a couple of notes, but uh, invariably... Yeah, we, we are. I just wanted right. to ask this question to both of you. There are two people that remain throughout the entire series, the butler and the controller. Do you think either of them are decent candidates for number one? Ooh. Yeah, in one sense, the... Uh the butler, I think, is a decent candidate for it. It would have the kind of irony that McGowan would love. Um, I just think right. the controller is a kind of an ice-cold bureaucrat type. I don't really see him as being the leader of the island. Maybe the butler, though. The butler did it. I mean, in interesting the way you <laughs> phrase it, Cardinal, because it, you would think, by definition... It could only be someone that is indeed in every episode. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense. The, the controller would want to be there pretty much the entire time. Mm -hmm. And, of course, like Tracy mentioned, the butler knows all, sees all. He's everywhere. Right. Except for one episode where I believe he gets fired. Or maybe he retires. I don't know. Um, but... Uh, not to bring anyone down, but Virginia Maskell, mm. who plays Cobb's friend, was a tragic actress that later committed suicide. 
And in her close-ups, really? you can see, yeah, you can see the real pain in her eyes. Don Chaffee cast her because he'd worked with her in a great film called The Man Upstairs, and he also worked with her on an episode of Danger Man. And so, on a how did you find out? Uh, how did you find out about her background, Gil? Well, I did some research. So, what do you know um, about her? I'm very curious about that. When you say she had well, a on a on a bitterly life. cold day on January 24th mm-hmm. of 1968. Virginia Mm -hmm. took a major overdose of antidepressants, drove away Mm -hmm. from her home at Princess Risborough. She was found collapsed in a nearby wooded area the next day, suffering from acute hypothermia. Although she was briefly revived, she died shortly thereafter at a nearby hospital. And Virginia won a posthumous National Board of Review Award and a BAFTA nomination for her work in Interlude. During her relatively short career, the actress seemed doomed to play unhappy, sympathetic third parties in romantic romantic triangles. While a notable sadness touched many of Virginia Maskell's roles, her performances are all the more haunting to watch knowing her personal tragedy. Tragedy. And that's according to Gary Bumbra. And it was a sad, kind of a sad character, too. She was. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In fact, that line where they, the guy says, we're all pawns, my dear, or whatever. Yeah. Um, we kind of put the most character important in place. line of this episode. Mm-hmm. I agree. We're all pawns. And yes. they're. Go ahead. Sorry. There have been two crying ladies in this episode, and number six isn't buying it. And I think they're meant to be, you know, crocodile tears. They're meant to come off as mm. so the yep. audience knows that they're putting him on. Like he's made. I got to be honest with you. I think the first, the first character, the blonde girl, that I guess is working as his maid. Yeah. I definitely think those are crocodile tears. But oh, the character absolutely. that we just, a just talked, the one that we just talked about, um, uh, Virginia Marksell. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm what she had gone through right and what she was about to go through. Uh, Tracy, you froze up. Uh, you said the one oh, that boy. we were just talking about. Once again, the timing was awesome. Mm-hmm. kind of like now go ahead tracy <laughs> when you can i was just saying that i think that the the what was her name again gill the lady that killed herself virginia marksell yeah her character oh, i think sorry maskell not marksell okay. maskell maskell i i feel her character is is legitimately sad and unhappy she was sad about what happened to cobb and how she had to do things to manipulate Cobb, and I think she was sad about having to um, manipulate number six, too. So I don't think those were crocodile dial tears from her, but I do think the first crocodile tears, the, the blonde maid, yes, I agree with that, definitely. Yeah, that's revealed in the story, because then we, we go back to, to uh, number two talking about it. Yeah, it was a gambit mm-hmm. that didn't work. Mm-hmm. Well, and... Since you mentioned Gambit, you know, she's uh, having a meeting with number two and number six is playing chess with the ex-admiral and loses because he's watching the girl, which is the name of her character. Uh, She gives him the uh, electro pass, which is just a watch with a light Mm -hmm. on it and arms that spin around and she admits that she was assigned to Cobb and to number six, but it's cool. She wasn't going to tell them anything. Mm -hmm. And then there were these hot nubile women in bikinis, which you never see ever again in the show, which is kind of out of place. So number six manages to get into the helicopter past Rover because of electro pass. There's a great, spooky Ron Grainer soundtrack, by the way. Uh, Number six thinks he's flying away, but they bring him back. 
And then, of course, Cobb is just leaving the control room and says, don't be too hard on the girl. And the new number two says, au revoir. And Cobb says, auf Wiedersehen and not be seeing you. Mm-hmm. Which I thought was very interesting. Because they talk about yes. speaking languages at the beginning of the episode, don't they? Why do you speak French? You look like you could speak French. Hmm. And then, yeah, the Japanese driver says, uh, you could be Czech or Polish. Yep. I couldn't tell. Polish? You're new movie. And you know what, guys? Too. I'm also realizing what a Eurocentric show this is. I mean, it's everything involved in the prisoner really has to do with Europe, nothing with the United States. I mean, I don't, I don't remember whether there are any Americans actors ever in the series. I guess there probably were one or two, but it's all about East Europe versus West Europe. That's kind of what it all centers around. One you know, the of the things, Tracy, that I learned mm-hmm. in my research was that they had been working with a casting director that used a lot of the same actors that they used on Danger Man and lots mm. of other series. And Patrick McGowan specifically wanted actors to be weird and to look mm. different. Even if they were actors that we might have seen on Danger Man, he wanted mm. them to be quirky, act different, something so that it wouldn't look the same. Mm-hmm. I remember, again, not having watched the series in a long time, but the way they kept changing the number two characters. Can you guys still hear me? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes. The way yep. they kept changing the number, the number two characters throughout. Hmm? Go ahead, Tracy. Oh, I'm sorry. The way they kept changing the number two characters were sometimes they're kind of jovial, sometimes they're sardonic. Sometimes they're angry and iron fisted. The number twos basically change from show to show with the uh, implication that they were getting replaced and canned for not being able to break him. That one right. of them tries, doesn't work. They're off to Siberia. Maybe not. Exactly. You know? Except for yeah. Cobb, who mm-hmm. says more or less, I'll make sure and tell people you know how well you're doing and the new number two which is also interesting that in this first episode of arrival there is a new number two uh tells him oh thanks i appreciate that and you know good luck in your next position so he's getting off the island but he's not being fired cobb was never a number two though was he no no he yeah, was just an operative. Right. right. So um, I'm thinking about the way that the number twos keep changing is a yeah. very smart way to do the series. Because I think really, so. And I agree entirely. Yeah. It has to do with the fact that you failed to break number six. You failed mm-hmm. to get the information why he retired. And every right. episode it changes. Although Leo McKern gets a shot at it twice, which is interesting. Right, 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 right. Right. Uh, Captain, sure. yes. can you read the Polish that Nucho13 has put up on the screen? I, I fear I'm going to garble it, and therefore my, my actual ignorance of Polish will thus be revealed. I'm actually a secret agent, but it is along the lines of So something, something, not speaking Polish. Hmm. <laughs> How something, like, I, something like, uh, I'm terribly sorry, I can't speak Polish. Yeah, that's well. That's probably <laughs> my, my line. You see, uh, it's a passion barzo. Yeah, new movie po polsku. Yeah, there's only a part of the troska po polsku. New movie, new movie in girlsku. <laughs> and then they don't believe me. Oh, the irony. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's funny. Um, although I refer Tracy to the good captain as a Brit, uh, he spent, I believe, the first eight years of his life in Poland, and then really? his yes, family uh, wow. got out. And went to the UK and lived in England. And mm. then uh, more recently, he moved to New Zealand, which is where he's in lockdown oh, that's right. currently. You told me that. So it really is a village. 
Yep, yeah, on, you know, on um, the ex expat immigrant. And just like the prisoners, yeah. spoiler alert, I did have yeah. a, a quick adventure in London and then I popped back again. The whole thing was like a dream. Oh, wow. anyway. How did you guys meet? Um, we met in the chat of a YouTuber that we, uh, well, that I follow. I'm not sure if Captain still follows him like he did, but uh, the the comments that the Captain would post in the chat were intelligent, thoughtful, sarcastic, snarky, and also very well informed. And mm. so I chatted him up uh, in the chat, as it were, and uh, we're kindred spirits. We're birds of a feather. Uh, we Makes we like the sense. same kinds of things. Uh, you know, we have similar senses of humor. So we work together well. Mm -hmm. Makes well, sense. As you said, the Cardinal discovered me, basically. I was working as a waitress in a cocktail bar when he met me. He said, he said oh, no. hey, kid, you've got a good face for radio. Come with me. And here we are now. <laughs> you could have said I was working as a waitress at a cocktail bar. That much is true. That, yes. There you go. You've got the nice memory. <laughs> okay, so I have finished sort of the, the order I was going in. So if you guys have things that you want to talk about, that uh, previously might have been spoiled, please. Continue. Yes. Well, speaking of spoiled, because uh, one of the things I've, I've learned to, to observe about shows or movies is rewatch value. And there's some very good movies out there that I'm just like, oh, I'm not sure if I could see that again. And there's some stuff hmm. that isn't the best movie in the world, but I'll just see it again and again. And one thing that I realize is a lot of uh, the rewatching The Prisoner, uh, as let's say, a reminder research for this show is that uh, uh, it really works very well on the first viewing because the whole thing is the mystery. You're basically confused with this guy. He wakes up in the village, doesn't know what's going on. But then, of course, watching it a second and third and fourth time and, of course, knowing the rest of the show, then you, all these things he's going through, we as the audience, it's like he wakes up, I don't know where I am. And we're like, well, you're clearly in the village, mate, but you don't know that yet. But then they put in one line that's a pun but you only know it's a pun when you re-watch it. And it's little mm -hmm. details like that that make me so happy that I can be on the YouTube channel to point them out. But basically, when he mm. first picks up the phone, after he sees the uh, the French maid, you know, we'll be open in a minute. Uh, you're, you're new here, aren't you? Right, and then off he goes. I mean, you get, you find, so he finds the phone, and then he picks it up, and she goes, number, please. And I thought, ah, that's a pun. Because uh, he thinks uh. she means phone number, but no, it's because he's going to discover later mm. that he is, of course, number six. I'm realizing that's only a pun if you're watching it the second time round. So it's, a, mm -hmm. it's deliberately a joke that only works on rewatch value. Now, that is clever writing. Yeah, that never thought about that. And you're absolutely right. Um, you know, for me, I want you guys to know, I thought this was interesting, too, that in watching Arrival for the first time, I think since that time I saw it in Miami Beach, I purposely wanted my wife to watch it with me because she had never seen The Prisoner. She's a little bit too young to remember it. And she only really knows about it because she's heard me so many times say how much it influenced me and how much I loved it. So getting her to watch it for the first time was really interesting. And she watched in total silence for the first, you know, 20 minutes. And I was thinking to myself, oh, maybe she doesn't like this. Maybe it's too weird. It's too 60s, it's too whatever. She absolutely loved it. She now is like really excited to see them all. So that was fun. Right. And it was interesting to see how someone who had no exposure to it would see it. And, and again, when, the, when we started to watch the episode, I thought, well, I better tell her a little bit of background for this or she's probably going to get a bit lost. So I told her a little bit about Danger Man and how it was basically the same character. And that's pretty much all I told her. I told her he's a secret agent and he wants to resign and everyone is all freaked out about why he resigned. And I said, that's all I'll tell you. And then she watched the whole thing and she ate it up. She loved it. So it was really interesting. Of course she did. Robin has excellent taste. 
Uh, thank you. And along the same lines, after we got married, one of the first things I did with her, we watched all the Twilight Zones. They came on on this one channel, and we would TiVo them. I skipped a few that I didn't like, but almost all of them. We watched 90% of all the Twilight Zones. So she got to knew them like the back of her hand, which was great. And we're about to do that with The Outer Limits, too. We just got the box set. So those are my staples. I would say The Prisoner, The Outer Limits, and Twilight Zone were the three shows that influenced me. Not really the original Star Trek. It's kind of a close fourth. But those are the three that I really gravitate to. But something that many people may not know about you, Tracy, is that mm -hmm. Joe Stefano of the original Outer Limits was your first mentor. And Gene right. Roddenberry in Star Trek The Next Generation was your second mentor, correct? That's really, really true, Gil. And I think the term mentor is sometimes thrown around too easily. But in my case... I was super lucky that these two men really were mentors to me because they were kind of old enough to be my grandfather. And they took a they got they took a liking to me and took a created a real bond with me. And uh I mean I, I learned a lot about writing and producing from Roddenberry and Stefano. Um very different types of guys too. Um, Stefano is not remembered, I think, today as much as he should be. I mean, the guy was amazing. He wrote the original script for Psycho. He created The Outer Limits. I didn't among other know things. that. I thought Robert yeah. Block wrote the screenplay for Psycho. No, Stefano did. And wow. then he went on to work with Hitchcock, I think, three or four times. And... uh Brilliant, brilliant guy. Um, very intense. And of course, Robert Block's mentor of a support was H.P. Lovecraft. Mm, yeah, right. I've heard that too. And uh, a lot of people also don't know that Joe Stefano, the creator of The Outer Limits and the guy who wrote, I think, the best episodes, he was only with it for one season. And uh, he got in a dispute with the network over what the time slot was going to be for the outer limits the second year. And he decided they'd put him in a time slot that was absolutely like a graveyard. There was no way the show was going to survive. So he, out of sort of protest, walked away. And he didn't work on the, the show the second season. Boy, And was really you know, a man of a lot of principle. Yeah. I've heard yeah. that somewhere before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I learned a lot there, yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, and, of course, this is a great time for us to let everybody know that uh, later today at 7 p.m. Central, uh, Tracy will be back with us for Masters of the Genre along with Mark Scott Zacree. And we are going to be talking sliders. So, intensified please be sure to come back so you can ask Tracy your question. And Slider's blog has done a great favor in getting the word out, so I really appreciate that. And also maybe we'll talk Twilight Zone, huh? We will. And we're also yeah. going to talk about uh, Mark's new book, Greenlighting Yourself. And mm. he has a new show called Space Command, you might have heard of. And mm -hmm. he basically, for the last, I think, 26 years or 16 years, we'll have to ask him, has, along with his wife, Elaine, put together a roundtable that's called the Director's Forum or something like that. I'll ask him tonight. And it's basically been him giving free advice to screenwriters, actors, people that want to be producers, directors, etc. And he moved it to YouTube. So every episode mm. takes place on YouTube and there's just like an order that people get in like a queue and ask him questions about, you know, what should I do for this next step or 
how to find you know funding or right. that kind of thing. Great yeah, idea. He doesn't want to work in movies. Mm. Well, yeah. I mean, he's not only been a showrunner himself, but created hundreds of hours of television, written like almost every series that you've ever heard of and some that you haven't heard of. Um, so, yeah, he's worked what, at Gil, every level. What did he, what did he show run, Gil? Oh, my gosh. I, I have to break out the uh, IMDB. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, he's, he's, he's definitely the showrunner of, of Space Command, that much I can say. Uh, mm -hmm. But we'll find out later tonight, right? Sounds good. Because we're we're going to be here for that, and uh, again, uh, thanks to Sliders fan blog, bah, I was able to get it out that time. Who oh, says love the Twilight Zone? And one interesting thing about the Twilight Zone, of course, Mark wrote the Twilight Zone Companion, which is an indispensable you know, book for fans of, of the series, which is a foundational series. And we talked about mm -hmm. that last time you were on Tracy, but mm -hmm. on the Blu-ray box set of the twilight zone, each episode has a commentary from Mark Scott Zakri. Mm -hmm. And for the ones in which he didn't do a commentary, he is, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding the further commentaries so that you'll be able to sit down, play his commentary track, and play the Twilight Zone episode, and you'll have it all right there. And I have no doubt on the next release of, let's say, the 4K edition of the Twilight Zone or whatever, uh, those will probably be incorporated as well. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. He's, the funny he's a thing great is, uh, guy. You know, I was close with Harlan Ellison, and it was through him that I went to meet some of the Twilight Zone staff when they did the remake of the show, um, the one with Phil Daguerre or whatever. And we picked an episode for a, um, a, re a rewrite. Uh, not a rewrite. What do you call it when you redo an episode? Uh, a reboot? Um, a remake? Or you could call it a reboot. A remake. So a re I was going to do re an episode, a re uh, a, re an updated ep episode. Do you remember the one called The Lonely? About the guy who's a prisoner alone on an asteroid. Of and course. he's given a yeah. robot girl. That's the one we were going to do. And I was actually working on it when the show was canceled. So I never You're actually... Place the model. <laughs> we were going to move it from a desert asteroid to a jungle asteroid to give it a different look. It was, he mm. was like marooned on a jungle planet and he's given a robot girl. And there was a different ending than the original show had. I had a different sort of twist ending to it and it would well, have I been guess fun. It's, it never been made. You can, you can tell us. Yeah. Oh, the ending to the, sh the version I was going to do, Instead of well, first the planet, we should tell people about the ending of the original episode, The Lonely. Right. So on the original, in the original ending, episode, there's a ship, a rocket ship, because back then everything looked like a rocket, right? Mm -hmm. So they would bring him supplies, and mm -hmm. one time the captain brings him a present, and it's this robot girl companion. And initially, he's totally against it. But then, of course, as time goes by, it becomes his companion. And then at the end of the episode, the captain comes back for an unscheduled visit and says, great news, you've been paroled. You're going to come back to Earth. But we can't take any of your stuff. You know, all the things that he's brought him over the years, the cards and the things to help him pass the time. He has to leave. So this companion, this robot woman, would have to stay. And he says, no, I won't go. Right? And keep going. The captain, you know, takes a gun out 
and shoots her and kills her, destroys her, and tells him you've got to forget about her and move on with your life. So that's the original ending. We were going to do an ending where he's getting ready to leave and she kills him. She doesn't want to be left alone. And instead, she takes a gun out and shoots him dead. So it's kind of rever- a reverse. The captain? Of, uh, no, the, uh, the, the girl, the, the robot girl, shoots yeah. the prisoner. They yeah. don't leave me, bang. So that's the way we were going to do it. And uh, yeah, there'll be a lot to talk to Mark that's about. That's a I, really I cool it. switcheroo. I love that, Tracy. Mm-hmm. That's very that imaginative. Yeah, How I, about I like it turns that, out that the captain is a replicant? I mean, a robot. I mean, it doesn't matter. Moving on. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I'm uh, a big thing. fan as a screenwriter of the twist ending that you can't see coming at the end. Me so too. I love it. Yep. Oh, we tried to do that with seen. sliders, by the way. Can't if you ever watch the first few seasons of sliders, they almost all have a little bit of a twist at the end. And that was my yeah. Twilight Zone influence, you know, lots of no uh, about it. cliffhangers, as a matter of fact. Yeah, we tried to do that, too. At the yep. end of seasons. Which are great. The good old days. <laughs> I, Tracy, I have to tell you, even though we're saving our our sliders chat for tonight, um, I was such a huge fan of the way that you put sliders together, wrote it, um, and it, it appealed to me as a fan of all the shows that you just mentioned. It was obvious that the person... You know, I didn't know who Tracy Torme was when Sliders came out. Mm-hmm. And I, I also didn't know, you know, because I was just learning screenwriting at that time. And I still wasn't paying attention to, like, who the writer is, who's the showrunner, the director, that kind of thing. So I realized that there was a change of who's in control between the, let's say, the first season and the fifth season. Uh, mm-hmm. but, um, I never, I never watched to find out, you know, who was in control. It always said Tracy Torme as the creator or the co-creator, even I think in those later seasons, um, uh, PJ who was scheduled to co-host on masters of the genre tonight, and we'll probably pop in later. I think he accidentally scheduled an interview uh, at that same time. He did an entire Sliders rewatch just for tonight. We watched the entire oh, wow. the entire uh, show, uh, all five seasons. And he commented that uh, he didn't really like the fifth season as well as the early ones. I, I didn't hear you, Gil. You went out on me. You said he did a yeah, entire. Yeah, I, I did that on purpose. All, I, I, I that's don't. All wanna, I heard. I don't want to, uh, you know, steal his thunder. Make make Mark upset, but uh, actually, I don't know how long Mark worked on the show. But uh, PJ said that he was disappointed in the last couple of seasons as compared to the first few. Yeah. It'd be interesting to me to see what, what Mark thinks about that because I have respect for Mark and I didn't want to step on his toes in those later years. Uh, he was the, you know sort of the one person on the staff that I really had previous a lot of respect for. But I'm curious if he had any of uh, the same frustrations with David Peckinpah that I did. I've really never talked to him about that before. So that'll be interesting and, to see. And he's related to Sam Peckinpah? Yeah, he's his nephew. Nephew, right. Yeah. Yep, he's his nephew, but uh, strange cat. He's dead now, so I feel a little bit bad about, you know, talking badly about him. But on the other hand, it is what it is. That's the way I look at it. But we'll we'll talk about and, it tonight, uh, I guess. One of my mods, Canadian Spider-Man, said, uh, what a great first hour it's now been almost an hour and 45 minutes thanks for watching everyone what questions do you have for the panel so yes if anyone has questions please fire away if you can keep them to the prisoner i always suspected that spider-man was really
<laughs> it was really Canadian. Yeah. Oh, no, he's not. Uh, Spider-Man is Canadian. He is the Canadian Spider-Man. So there is still the original Spider-Man, Peter Parker from Queens, New York. I used to live in Queens, and <laughs> so uh, I'd see Spidey around. That's uh, the original USA Spider-Man, or you could say American Spider-Man, but of course uh, Canada is in America, so it gets good. So no, this is the <laughs> light Mexican it's in Iron Man. He's North the, America, uh, yes. Strangely, yeah. Canadian so, Spider-Man has never read a single issue of Spider-Man. The irony. Really? Yes, True really. Fact. You're kidding. That's crazy. It's, it's insane, isn't it? That's Spidey all over. Now I've got a um, question. Yeah, go ahead. Or, or, or a question, a questioning maybe, because you were saying that uh, from a writing point of view, there, Cardinal, uh, the old twist through the twist ending. But you were saying the twist ending that arrives from out of nowhere. And I had to just, uh, <clears throat> as a writer, had to just jump on that because there's got to be a, a certain element. This is the paradox of the twist ending. A certain element of. Uh, inevitability after the fact because uh you can't have a completely out there from out of out of the blue twist ending you, you couldn't end uh game of thrones with suddenly the throne achieving sentience going i'll let, tell you what i let me I'll, let I'll, me I'll, be the winner. Let, I'll tell you what let me rescind that statement nice um nice. i'm a big fan of the twist ending it's not fair to make it one that a savvy viewer can't see coming. Oh, what I meant twist, was I'm a big fan of twist endings that if you're not paying attention, you won't see coming from a mile away. Because, yes. again, as a screenwriter, once you study screenwriting, and Tracy, I hope you'll back me up on this, it ruins 95% of movies and television for you, right? Uh yeah, well, I would say if you see it coming, it's really not a twist ending. I mean, the only way it really works is a twist ending. It's something that you throw in at the end that's a total left turn from where you thought it was going. That's what the that's Twilight nice. Zone was so brilliant at. Um, that's yeah, the twist. That's true. It's be, yeah, it's got to be within those plausible parameters that afterwards, the, you know, the view, there's a, I guess it's that all important fine line between the viewer going, Oh wow! I wasn't expecting that. Uh, between oh, where that was? Where did that come from? That's ridiculous. And so it's got to be. I almost feel that uh, <clears throat> it is a fine line between uh, excellence and the other thing. But uh, if you can maybe, if you as as a uh, the viewer pick it up just before they reveal it, then it's like, well, it's good for you for picking it up. You clearly you are a writer. But it also, mm -hmm. the later you pick it up than the better because it's like ah they didn't quite telegraph it it was subtle mm -hmm, very true and uh canadian spider-man is asking about uh you know the setting of uh the prisoner the prisoner and he asks how much did the actual island setting itself influence the show the prisoner for instance, how different would it be if it were set in Jamaica? The interesting thing that you see in this episode, Arrival, is that when he gets the map of the island, it's actually a map of Port Marion, which is the northwest edge of Wales. So it's on sort of a peninsula. There's... there's water on three sides but the end of the map it's it's land so mm. even though it's supposed to be an island um and he gets off the island throughout the series several times um always to return of course or does he um but actually it, although it's supposed to be an island it's it's actually on the northwest tip of wales more like I think that to answer to answer the gentleman's question, uh, the setting of Port Marion is absolutely critical to the the everything about the show. I mean, I keep thinking if they had tried to just put up some relatively cheap sets and done it that way, it would have had a totally different feel than what it does now with this real real strange 
ethereal place, Port Marion. I mean, they found the perfect place to do this show. And maybe that's one of the reasons that the Prisoner remake was so bad. They really couldn't duplicate the look of the It was so god-awful. Awful. Couldn't what be was, worse. What was the word I'd, you used for it ex- last time? Execrable. Putrid, Joint. maybe? <laughs> Regrettable. Uh, Gil, if Detestable. you ever get a chance to... If you ever get a chance to research the remake the same way you researched, you know, the thing, I would love to know who is behind the remake, what company, what producer, what writer, director, because I was staggered by how bad it was. It's like you can do something and say, well, I can probably find out. Yeah, it was a little dull or something, but the prisoner remake was absolutely abysmal from beginning to end, and I would say it was unwatchable. You, anyone that stayed with it for all four hours or whatever it was, they got to receive a, a medal because it was that <laughs> bad. I I honestly don't think I would ever research the remake uh, to the degree that I did uh, because it had Ian McKellen and Jim Cav- uh, Cavazil. Uh, I think people expected it was going to oh, yeah, be that's right. really good. I for, don't look I at it, Marion. Yeah, don't look. Don't look. Um, don't, let's don't see if I can find out remake. who was behind it. I'm taken with Spidey's idea, though. Caribbean Prisoner. I mean, the dialogue would be a little bit different, wouldn't it be? Ah, number six, Jara Safari. We'll be open in a mm-hmm. minute, Anting. Just sit yourself. Mm-hmm. Park yeah. yourself there. Brilliant. So here's... <laughs> Here's what the Internet Movie Database says about the 2009 remake of The Prisoner, which no one should ever watch under any Mm -hmm. circumstances. Watch the the original and and never watch the remake. Uh, And so say all of us. It says Nick Huron directed six episodes, which is, I think, all there were. And Bill Gallagher... uh, wrote six episodes so it's uh nick hern and bill gallagher any idea who either of those guys are nope never heard I'm of still either thinking one of them. about the caribbean prisoner because the soundtrack could be just the uh, far out dub reggae <laughs> black arc excursion that'd be brilliant the prisoner and ting the prisoner um, and ting, a it's a go series Spider, production management I don't know if you would know any of those people. Uh, Grant David Cinnamon, Gary Connolly, Laura Metcalf, Angela Phillips, Jean Rue Viljon, and Gail Kennett. Um, but it doesn't list any, you know, like companies per se, at least so far. Are there any reviews of it? Uh, let's see. I I imagine there are. How about the prisoner, Craggy Island? Which okay, you here's one. There now, number six. Go on, go on, go on. Sit down there now, prisoner. Uh, so this person gave it eight out of ten. Oh Ooh. God. Uh. A man resigns from a mysterious agency. Soon he finds himself in a place only known as the village where no one has a name but is a number where he's redubbed six by a leader, a man known only as two. Resisting two's attempts to break his mind with his insistence, I am not a number, I am a free man. Six begins trying to escape while trying to piece together what and where the village really is. That, in short, is the premise of the six-episode miniseries reimagining of the classic 1967 Patrick McGowan TV series, The Prisoner. Six six episodes, as many as that. And I can't believe that anybody that liked the original liked the remake. I I think that that was written by a reviewer that had never seen the original. I think you're right. 
And yeah, uh, this is this is one of the reasons why the original is so good. I will not make any deals with you. Mm-hmm. I'm resigned. I will not be pushed, filed, stamped, indexed, briefed, debriefed, or numbered. My life is my own. Is it? Yes. You won't hold me. <laughs> and really? as we mentioned in the last episode, the uh, first episode of I'm Not a Number, uh, that this episode and this series, The Prisoner, has to do with individualism versus the encroachment of the surveillance state sort of getting closer and closer. There are cameras all over London now. Uh, in this episode, you know, number two is trying to show how closely they followed number one or number six, the prisoner when mm-hmm. he went on vacation, there's photographs on the big screen in blue of him, right. you know, from the bathroom mirror and mm. from his yearbook. And, you know, they have all of his information, information, information. You won't get it by hook or by crook. We will. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I would not be pushed, filed, stamped, numbered, briefed, debriefed, debriefed indexed, filed. My life <laughs> is my own. Is it? It is. <laughs> Very and, well said. Uh, we have a few more comments. Uh, Dej Odyssey oh, is here. Hail to Dej Odyssey. Uh, Three things. Deja Odyssey bows down to Tracy Torme. I believe he's <laughs> saying, I'm not worthy. Nice. Come on. And yeah. Michael Beacom is here and says, Greetings. Sorry I'm late to the chat. Good God, you're talking about the remake? Jesus. If you say if you say it thirteen <laughs> times in a mirror, oh if you say it three times in a mirror, it will start playing on your devices. That is what shows from hell do. <laughs> Quite right. Um, They're talking about it. I'm not. I don't know what to what they refer. I know not. And my main moderator on NT T Derivative Two says, "I also like when he knocks down those tinker toys during the, uh, you know, the examination phase. Huh. The sticks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's that's like when he's given the." Uh, uh, the application, you know, just put down your your religion, you know, family history, diseases, your politics, and that's when he gets in his face and knocks it all down. That's right. Um, he says the word politics and he loses his temper. Yeah. Um, oh, Gil, I should Matthew probably Pounder. Get ready for, yeah. Matthew Pounder says, have you heard the Big Finish version wasn't my cup of tea. Cup of I tea. didn't know there was an audio play. And, uh, of course, the Sliders fan blog says, Sliders I will blog. not be numbered. I think that's some of the challenges that we face today. Amen. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. We are just numbers yes. to them. Sign here, process that, pay this, text at source. Everyone, everyone needs to strive Absolutely. to be an individual. I think that's a really Absolutely. important thing today. Yep. I'm not. not and so no group for thing. next week, uh, Tracy, since uh, mm-hmm. Robin is becoming such a big fan, we're going to be <laughs> reviewing The Chimes of Big Ben. Okay, good to know. For next week. Chimes Sounds of good Big to me. Ben. Trivia fan. And fans. again, big ben I will put the viewing the clock, order but the bell. Uh, on the... Uh, in the description box of the live stream below when we're done so that everybody will be able to follow along. Sorry, were you talking and Unless anyone has anything else to say, we'll go ahead and wrap up. That's good. It's nice and neat on the two hours. All I've got to say is thank you both and be seeing you. Be seeing thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. 
Thank you, Tracy. While, we'll see you later tonight. All right, guys. Thank you. All right. Sounds good. And until then. Bye-bye. You've tuned in to I Am Not a Number Live, the review show with Cardinal Sin and Captain Cockney Spock, where we review a different episode of The Prisoner starring Patrick McGuhan. Each week, we discuss a different episode and its implications then and now. Follow along and make sure to catch the episode in our viewing order so you can be ready to ask questions and participate in the chat. New episodes premiere each week on Wednesdays from 3 to 5 Central. The show's surreal and political implications on the reduction of the individual to a number have an even more insidious impact today as all of our information, phone calls, texts, likes, photos, and other data are harvested to be sold and turn us into product rather than consumers. Get ready for a deep dive into one of the most important shows to have an impact on pop culture and society ever. And remember, I am not a number. I'm kind of proud of that. I put that together yesterday. <laughs> Nicely done. Oh, All right, gentlemen. Uh, for Captain Cockney Spock... And Tracy Torme, it's Cardinal 